The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the We Can 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the We Can Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the We Can Radio Team. Good afternoon and welcome to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I am your host, Michael McAuliffe, and with me is my co-host, Perry Haichu. And we're here for, a, for another week of discussion on, um, on issues local and national about uh, the cannabis movement and uh, things uh, related. So um, I'd like to start off today with, with something that we, uh, we briefly mentioned in our, our show last week but didn't really have time to cover, and that was um, a... a panel that occurred here in Clark County uh, a couple of weeks back uh, talking about uh, you know whether question two is a good thing or not a good thing for the citizens of Nevada and um, uh, I, I find it difficult in the state I don't see any really balanced discussions either you've got groups like us or or, or similar who are saying you know of course cannabis uh, legalization is, is a is a good thing because you're taking away all these harms it's a really polarizing issue yeah. it's hard to find middle ground on things like this you know you're kind of for us or you're against us kind of camp yeah, attitude at this point it's that's really true. strange how it's kind of evolved into that there used to be a lot of flexibility on the issue and a lot of negotiation going on but now it's you know, it's crutch time what we're 50 days out to the election or something like that so i think you're starting to see a little bit more uh more direct pressure being put on by both camps i think we're going to start to see the advertising really ramp up i mean i picked up this issue of vegas 7 the other day mm -hmm. and there's just advertisements for question two pro legalization all over the place and all the and local i see magazines. they've got a big pot leaf on the on the cover of it there yeah yeah, yeah. Pick up your uh, latest Pick issue your of Vegas seven. 7 and check it out. They have and what, are, what have they got to say? I see it says money, power, and respect. Oh, they're just interviewing various uh, industry leaders, you know, managers mm -hmm. of dispensaries and bartenders and things like that, trying to get their, their gauge of how the industry has developed so far and mm -hmm. where they think it's going to go, what will happen if legalization happens, what happened if not. They have a little breakdown of the various terpenes that are most common within, uh, within, a, uh, within the various cannabis strange that we so, most commonly that was the munchkins in the studio yeah, there for a moment um, that we most commonly see here but and, okay uh, so they're speaking with uh, people who are in the industry were were they interviewing uh people who are patients or were they interviewing people who are um no, mostly uh, industry casual folk. users no in industry folk uh not necessarily patients or things like that, but like here, here's a whole breakdown of what they had going on, like you know the Delta Nine, the CBDs, the lemony, the pinings, things mm -hmm. like that for mm -hmm. people who aren't really, who aren't really familiar with it. There's an interview with one of the lawyers that do a lot of work in the industry, a manager of a dispensary, a, 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 a master grower, you know. So the, trying it, to get a broad they've got they've got quite a few pages devoted to this. Yeah, well, it's the whole point. it's half the issue to tell you the truth, or most of the issue. And it's free, so get up it. there and pick out pick up Vegas 7 this week and, and there's a lot of information that you're going to have uh, because as we are closing in on the election and as you say Perry the, the undecided factor is shrinking you're for or against us it's, it's important for all of us all of us who know that um, that legalization regulation is a common sense solution and taking the control away from the black market we've got to be educated to get our friends, our neighbors, our family out there on our side of this issue. Uh, we don't want those undecideds being swayed in the other direction uh, because as somebody said just before we went on, there are, are billboards going up now and they're, they're saying, you know, a picture of, uh, of candy and saying, oh, can your kids tell the difference? Well, it, it's up to us to, to uh, let people know that it's about responsible parenting and it's about um, uh, responsible use in general you know and and that's true whether you're talking about pot whether you're talking about alcohol whether you're talking about firearms responsible use is, is the key here well I of think. course there's no personal responsibility or accountability in our society anymore everyone's either collectively responsible for everyone's mistakes or we need to be made that way or, or, or some variant of that it seems and besides that that whole billboard is complete nonsense because the laws in Nevada state that all of the edibles have to be clearly labeled mm -hmm. packaged in childproof packaging and there's this yep. whole procedure that was that was uh, negotiated through and 
in uh, legislature and within the ballot language or with the ballot initiative language. So I don't really understand, you know, how that really holds any water. It's just blatant fear mongering, the same old tactics that the other side has been utilizing successfully for decades. And they're just hoping that, uh, that it'll work with just one more time. That well, fear mongering does work as, as sure. Lee Atwater uh, proved in the 1970s, uh, negative campaigning sways a lot more voters than, you know, uh, you know, puppies and, and, roses and lollipops uh, and so uh, the reason that you see so much of that is it is effective uh, advertising is all about uh, either sex you're gonna get laid or scaring people you got to keep up with the Joneses oh. or, or and, whatever uh, like you were saying you you brought up a couple of pictures of this panel that mm -hmm. was uh, yeah, discussing I've, I've, the legalization I, I have, I've had time to <laughs> to count them and it looks like there are 60 seats uh, that were in this uh, uh, hearing uh, forum and uh, it looks maybe half of them were occupied but a big chunk of them uh, are the blue uniforms of Metro recruits and so it really is a captive audience and and this um, this panel uh, was led by uh, Earl White who is a former director of weed and seed program a, a crime and drug abuse prevention group and he was one of five speakers there um, and he he's adamantly against legalizing marijuana for recreational use arguing that pot use lessens someone's motivation to study or find work um, I don't know about that because uh, there are any number of people well. <laughs> from Peter Sperling, founder of, of uh, University of Phoenix, to um, uh, the Men's Warehouse House, uh, yeah, sure, we CEO, can, or, we, Harrison we, Ford, Brad Pitt, lots of well motivated people. Of course, of course. But, <laughs> you know, it's, I think that's a little agitating, but my counter argument with that, uh, to that would be if people who smoke cannabis were allowed to enter the workforce, this wouldn't really be an issue. Mm -hmm. There is, of course, a perception that potheads don't work. I think mainly because we're not allowed to seek work, especially in Las Vegas, where hair tests are so prominent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to clean out for at least three or four months before you can, you know, find a job. A lot of patients or, or people who even use recreationally just aren't willing to make that sacrifice. They right. just see it as an infringement upon their freedom, or just a personal uh, irritation that they don't want to deal with. They'll just seek work elsewhere. And, the, so, and there is work elsewhere. For people and I think what also happens is uh, if they if they can't get work in a corporate setting it motivates people to be more entrepreneurial and start their own gig or start oh, their own of thing. course of course uh, I don't I don't disrespect the creativity of, of cannabis users or anything of that mm -hmm. nature but I do think that a lot of people given the opportunity would settle right into a normal corporate gig if they had the opportunity to and continue their recreational uh, cannabis use or their or even more respectively their medicinal cannabis use and be very very happy because of it but you know that isn't really taken into account when a job interview is is, that's not on the questions, you know, that's well, not on the list of questions they have for you. I, I, I think that uh, from that aspect, cannabis use could, uh, could uh, dull the pain of the, of the mind-numbing uh, uh, duties of, of working for a lot of corporations, especially in the middle or lower levels. But also here, Pat Hickey, who's a, a state sure. in the state legislature, uh, he's a Nevada coordinator for Smart Approaches to Marijuana. And I, I'm aware of this group being in the movement and they are another prohibitionist group uh, the Kennedy uh, funded anti-cannabis yes group. RFK Jr. Uh, is is the one who uh, is uh, the most well known uh, on this and um, Pat Hickey was was agreeing with uh, uh, this fellow Earl White about the drugs potential hazards he said that legalizing the drug would break legal tradition America he has said uh, he said has never legalized marijuana uh, really Tell that to everybody who lives in Oregon or Washington or, or Colorado the who lived or here before, Alaska. or the people who lived, the infinite millions of people who lived in this country before they illegalized it. Yeah. So to say that it was illegal from the start is just not, you know, I don't really understand where he's coming from with that. That 
that doesn't really when it was mandatory in colonial times uh, for farmers to grow hemp and turn it over as part of their taxes to the British government who used that hemp to make rope for the for the British sure. Navy uh, and uh, hemp was still uh, used as a valid way of paying taxes in the early days of the Republic so okay. for for somebody to say you know uh, well, that America again, has never legalized marijuana and it said the drug would break yeah. legal tradition well you know once again I've used this example with you before and I'll say it one more time considering he's such a proud Republican uh, Ronald Reagan once said again that the status quo is Latin for the mess that we're in <laughs> so for people yeah. to just so blindly accept what is rather than work to change these bad laws really upsets me. I was listening to a radio host on my satellite radio a couple of weeks ago, and I thought of him as a fairly uh, progressive dude until they had someone on and they were talking about this gentleman who was thrown in jail for a disproportionately long time for his first marijuana growing offense compared to a guy who was recently indicted for uh, molesting children. And... Uh, he, they, they were just kind of having this back and forth and the guy is facing like a long time like 20 30 years in prison whereas the other guy might plea out the the child uh child, child abuse might case be might be four or five years yeah, yeah he very well may plead down to a very reasonable uh sentence comparatively and the guy's like well how do you feel you know asking the host he's like well how do you feel about this guy doing 30 years for cannabis he's like well if it's the law then off he goes and i'm just like dude like that's not that's not how it works. Like, if you see a bad law, you don't just say, oh, well, I guess we're just going to bend over and take that and accept it. No, you uh, you work to change that law as you see fit for yourself and your community. And I don't understand this, this broad statism that's infected the populace. It just really... Uh irks me. And then on the other side, you see a lot of radicals doing it the other way, you know, pushing for these very, very uh, fast changes in our social, mm -hmm. in our social uh, structure. So, you know, and they seem to be accepted very, it depends on the very issue. willingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Everyone and, bends over for and them. And as far so. as bad laws and, you know, uh, well, that's the law. I, I, I believe a couple of hundred years ago, people in this country had a revolution over the fact that there were bad laws that were taxing them unfairly and infringing on their liberties. Uh, and so uh, if it's a bad law, why would you keep a bad law? Why wouldn't you work like hell to overturn that law and to replace it with something better? If it doesn't affect people directly, I feel like there's a sense of complacency that they don't want to step out of, not necessarily their comfort zone, but people have a lot to lose, mm -hmm. you know, and people take a lot of risk just to live this standard of life that we have. A lot of people have credit card debt, mortgages and things like that. They don't really want to put anything their very fragile world in jeopardy by stepping out of what they uh, would perceive as the lines to maybe even support a cause that they would definitely get behind if it weren't for not necessarily a perception but something that they don't want to get involved with just because like even on an apathetic level mm -hmm. it's it's pro it's prominent uh, i have a friend in california who you know I, I i care about him very much he's a good buddy of mine and i asked him i'm like man it's coming up in california are you registered to vote are you going to go are you going to go do it? He's like, no. And his answer surprised me. He says, I have a medical card. I have as much access as I need so here in California. Else. So, to, you know, he's like, to hell with it. And I'm like, well, I'm just trying to make sure everyone's safe and this and that. And he's like, dude, I didn't even have my card and got pulled over and the cop let me slide and this and that. So he believes that the war is basically won mm -hmm. and he doesn't really care. And he's so apathetic to voting in general. And he believes that the system is so rigged and that even voting on a national or local level is so pointless that he shouldn't even register to vote because the work is, it's all almost predetermined because of the way the system works out. And, and I just couldn't believe what I'm hearing. I'm like, dude, you got to register and just vote for that one thing and then go home. Don't vote for the presidential candidates. Don't vote for the senators. Just vote for this and walk away. Refused. Just absolutely refused to. And I consider him a pretty intelligent, reasonable person on most issues. So that made me slightly upset. To, I, I wonder now how many other people in my age group or across the country have that same determined, apathetic view that no matter what, even if there's an issue that they should support, mm -hmm. they're not going to go vote. They, they're not going to they're not going to take any action. Well, typically uh, in America, uh, the closer you get to Social Security, the more you start voting. And when you get into that range, you you really you vote a lot because you want to make sure that your your Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, or whatever are protected. And and uh, the youth vote is 
traditionally very low. One of the things that took uh, Barack Obama uh, way over the top in 2008 was uh, an unprecedented youth vote uh, getting behind him. And you know, you can go back decades before and see that there in the in 1968 there was a, uh, a a big youth vote that got behind Bobby Kennedy, and when he was assassinated, uh, they just dissipated. They lost their enthusiasm. And to some degree, you're seeing the same thing with this Sanders. year with Bernie Sanders, who yeah. got all these young people really involved in thinking that we can make all this change. And then when um, when Hillary Clinton won the nomination, uh, these people are all saying, well, we're, we're going to vote for Jill Stein, or maybe we'll vote for Gary well, Johnson, but we're not going to vote for the Democrat, even though we're Democrats, but um, we don't like Hillary. Well, well after he lost the either, nomination, but. they felt like it was rigged. And then after he came out and endorsed her, after he, well, they didn't really get most of the story. He kind of, I think he did some work behind the scenes to try to push her toward a lot of his platform And he did. Uh, the, platform the Democratic issues. platform became a lot more progressive. Yeah, and he was really happy with that, so he was willing to say, look, you know, I feel like I got what I needed to do done, and you know, he endorsed her, and I think that really hurt the soul of a lot of the more mm -hmm. die-hard Bernie supporters who really wanted to see this revolution he was talking about, and by capitulating to her in that way, I feel like a lot of them felt like he kind of sold out, kind of like a lot of the true libertarians felt like Ron Paul sold out when he registered as a mm -hmm. Republican to run. He's like, how could you, you know, how could you, you know, do that? How, how could you betray your colors? Yeah, how could yeah. you how could you do that? And it's just like it's politics, you know. It is what it is. But I really do believe what you said. A lot of the young people are so just upset about that that maybe they just won't vote at all, no matter what, even if it's for a, a recreational legalization campaign. And, you know, the interesting thing is it ties into to what this this fellow with the weed and seed program said, arguing that pot lessens someone's motivation and. You know, the other side will seize on the youth vote if they sit out saying, oh, you know, they're too stoned, they don't care, and they're not going to vote uh, because they're too stoned. But it, they're grabbing the spin that they want out of it. But what you're explaining here is a totally different direction that the people are, the, the young people who are not voting are not doing so because they're too zoned out, you know, eating Cheetos and playing video games, but that they see a system as fundamentally so flawed that they don't see any way that their participation is going to be able right. to change. Well, and my friend went on to explain when I was trying to break him in. I'm like, you got to vote. And he's just like, look, he's mm -hmm. like, if they really wanted us to vote, they would make it easier. He's like, why can't we vote from home? Why isn't everyone automatically registered to vote when you go to the DMV? Why isn't it, you know, why is there only one day when you have to show up at a certain time? You know, why is it this way? He was like, if people, he's like, the technology is there, but he's like, you have to go to these certain, you know, and these like companies make the ballot boxes and da, 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 da. And he's like, if you wanted it to be pure, and really do it right, everyone could vote very easily, but they purposely make it this way to do it, da, da, da. and he had this whole like conspiracy theory kind of thing, and, and I asked him, I said, well, what if election day was made a national holiday, and mm -hmm. everyone got the day off work, and everyone was free to go vote, and he said, you know, that's still not, that's, the, nah. that's not enough, you know. We, I, I agree, we should, we should expand voting, we should have uh, voting by mail for everybody in Oregon, uh, for example, uh, they send out ballots to everyone who's living in the mm -hmm. state who's eligible, uh, to vote and and they, you're automatically they registered you're to vote and you go to, to the DMV. But understand that this um, uh, this country was founded uh, with the thought that voting is really important. If you're a white man, you had the right and the obligation to vote. And it wasn't until after the Civil War and Reconstruction that uh, Congress grudgingly gave black men the the right to vote but still held on for another 60 years for women for women because yeah. they can't be trusted to vote all right and and so they 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 held this on and if you look at, at politics in the in the last 30 years um, and the fact that we have a decreasing percentage of Caucasian Americans in this country uh, compared with uh, African Americans with Latinos with other groups coming in as as the white majority has seen that market share if you will erode that legislatures particularly legislatures in conservative states, um, have done everything they can to stymie the advance of this. And, and that's why a oh, Supreme sure. Court decades ago uh, enforced a uh, 
voting rights controls and monitoring of certain states, mostly in the Deep South, uh, who were seen as being restrictive of voting. Oh, sure. Well, and it's like my, I have a relative who said on the other side of that, he's like, look, you know, if people really cared about voting, they would show up. Mm -hmm. So why should we continue to bend over backwards to make it so much easier for people who probably aren't really educated on the issues to make these decisions on the behalf of the rest of us? Why shouldn't, you know, why should we do this? And if it really is a big deal about having an ID, well, you know, if the government subsidizes people's houses mm -hmm. and food and cell phones and all this other crap, why can't we just put someone's picture on their social security card? Is that really that hard to do? Mm -hmm. No, it isn't. The fact, the fact is that these common sense measures are not taken for various political reasons instituted by various entities or politicians who have, you know, for well, in, whatever in part, reason, choose to do this. In part, though, it's because um, the law prohibits us from having a national ID. We do not have a national ID card, and, and well, uh, we have, we're not allowed to. So, well, what, what do you call the real ID? The real ID is now de facto a national ID because it's this thing you can't get on and you can't enter it's federal building with It's de facto, but it's it. still administered through the state. Yeah, sure, but with federal approval, yeah. it's become a de facto federal authoritative thing through the state governments. Mm -hmm. Now, you can go ahead and not get it, but you can't fly on a plane. You can't right. get on an Amtrak. You can't go into a federal courthouse. You can't do a whole bunch of stuff. So, of course, they kind of force you into it. And, of mm -hmm. course, if you want to get a passport, which is another form of federal Absolutely. identification, and a Social Security card, which is another form of federal identification. But the thing so, is, that a, the passport is a voluntary thing. You don't have to get a passport. You you decide to, to go sure. out there and you're, you're going to sure. travel abroad. Social Security is a mandatory program for all citizens. And so uh, I think that's where the difference is. But I absolutely agree with you. They should make it easier to vote. And what we see happening uh, in court decisions right now uh, from the Supreme Court on down are uh, largely decisions that are um, overturning uh, the ability of states to limit and restrict voting. Uh, and but all so those limits are usually thing. surrounding identification, like bringing your ID to mm -hmm. make sure that the right people are voting. So that's why I don't understand when these same, the same uh, I don't want to call them liberal because usually uh, like liberals aren't very liberal anymore. I like to call them radicals a lot of times because mm -hmm. that's a lot of the policies they're proje projecting. But um, when you're when you refuse to check someone's identification to make sure they vote, but then you will turn around and require that person to have ID to collect welfare mm -hmm. or to, you know, apply for a job or even to get a fishing license or, you know, any of these very, very social security or any of these very, very simple things, get a library card, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden though, it becomes racist when you're asking them so to do that. it sounds like you're arguing for more, for more restrictive there's, well, because there's, you want to put ID on this. And, and I want to just make sure that the right people are voting. I think we should, if people can't afford to get an ID, mm -hmm. we should subsidize it. Mm -hmm. And if they're registered to vote, then you should go ahead and vote. We but, should make it but easier given to that, register. That but voting, you know, um, you know Voting illegally, you know, voting multiple times, voting if you're not eligible to vote, voting if you're not registered in a certain state and trying to vote there. Those are all felonies. And I, I think very few people will do that. And in fact, study after study has shown that uh, the number of actual voter fraud on an individual level cases are, are you know, a drop in the bucket, less than, less than uh, two tenths of, or 0 0.2 tenths of a percent. It is a so. very small percentage, but true. But Florida was won by George Bush in 2000 by 500 and something votes, which would come out to, you know, less than that percentage point, which you're speaking well, of potentially. Florida was won by George Bush by the attorney general who was working for his brother. brother sure. You know, and so sure. that, that was that was a little different situation. Still, but, but, you, know, you know, given that given the, that most of our listeners. He was a good brother. Is here, <laughs> yeah, is here in Nevada. Um, I, am, I am pleased that in Nevada, it is easy to vote and, sure you know not only on election day but with early voting and they they move these places around the valley you so you have it in different supermarkets you have oh, it here at and the there and everything all month long. at the malls so it, it is easy and when i went to to vote earlier this year just not thinking of what the status of it was i said oh hey do i need to show you my driver's license and she's like no 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 absolutely not just come in here and sign in and then once i did she said oh yeah your signature looks like it did you know, before, so well, sure. we know you are who you are. Sure. So you and don't necessarily have to present that idea. And I'm not saying it's back in the day where you have buses of people being carted around, you know, oh, being you're forced about the to Democrats in Illinois being forced in, to in vote time over time yeah, yeah, over yeah. time. Vote but early, still, vote often. I am, you know, I am aware of, you know, uh, like they do roll buses out to job sites 
and put people on buses mm -hmm. on election day and take them to vote. Mm -hmm. And, and they, it's not and they exactly have optional. Places, they have polling places <laughs> down along the strip for uh, hotel workers, casino workers to vote there rather than in their home precinct because sure. it's just it's easier. And I think ultimately you do want to make it easier, as, as you were saying earlier, because you want a higher level of participation. You want it would be more nice. people taking having their opinions heard. And I think if we do, we get we'll have more but common at the sense opinion. Yeah, but at the same time, I would like to see people common sensely educated on the issues before they go in. I was a voter registrar during the year when uh, the Acorn people got busted for registering the Dallas mm -hmm. Cowboys here and all kinds of nonsense. Mm -hmm. And y you wouldn't believe the things that would come out of people's mouths when they're walking up to you trying to register to vote. They were trying to register to vote for Obama in 08, and they're like, oh, like he's the Republican, right? It's just like, dude, you know what? Yeah, bro, just sign, just check the box and sign it. I, I like, think it's what just happens like, is groups like that, whether it's ACORN or whether it's um, you know people uh, in the campaigns to, to register, for, to have any initiative, they're getting paid a dollar, a dollar fifty, two dollars a signature oh, that well, they have on there. Oh, well, that's for the petitions. So, we were know. getting paid hourly. They decided a while back that they weren't allowed to, uh, like we weren't allowed to get individual voter registrations per signature dollar that was looked upon as as for some reason they, they, they didn't want us doing that and then after all that went down the like I, th I think it was the Attorney General's office or mm -hmm. the department the electoral department came down and they're like look you can't have partisan voter reg at all right like you weren't supposed to be doing this in the first place and now we have no choice but to shut this down mm -hmm. and that's really why like I don't see as many voter registrators as I used to see. Like, I, they used to be everywhere, out at the grocery stores, out at the DMVs, and like maybe they're still there, but I don't see them in as many force. And I think that's as a result of what of what went down uh, all those years ago. But still, like I want to see people vote, but I just want to make sure, I don't want to say the right people are voting, but damn it, I want to see educated the right, people. The right people, me, meaning American citizens who uh, and who should be educated uh, on, uh, on the issues that they're talking about. Uh, we're going to have to take a quick commercial break here, uh, say hi to our sponsors, and no we'll doubt. be right back. Nevada Care is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Did you know that your medicine could contain pesticides, heavy metals, and even mold? Are you really sure that you're getting the same potency every single time? Well, the answer to that question is simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a state-approved laboratory run by scientists. So look for the Digipath Labs quality seal on your next medicine and on the door of your favorite dispensary. To learn more, go to digipathlabs.com. That's D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. And welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. We're pleased that you could join us today. Um, we've been speaking uh, earlier about uh, voting and the Question 2 initiative, but now I want to uh, go into another thing that, that is a, uh, another subject that is, is really big and all over the place. And, and I heard just before we went on now that the, even the president is addressing this. And what we're talking about is the opioid crisis in America and how that relates to uh, cannabis and, and medical cannabis. And um, I, I've seen uh, there's 
there's a new study that has come out uh, which says uh, that legalization of medical marijuana may reduce the instances of opioid use in adults under 40 years of age. And uh, this study involves uh, analyzing traffic accidents, and it was published in the uh, American Journal of Public Health, uh, and we're, we're getting this article from Newsweek. Um, and it said uh, they studied 69,000 drivers from eight, 18 states, and they're finding that uh, after the implementation of a medical marijuana law, there appears to be less opioid use, at least among young and middle-aged adults. Uh, and this uh, is from a, a study at Columbia University uh, uh, Mailman School of Public Health. And so uh, this just is the latest study to come on with many of them, which show that uh, cannabis use use can help uh, get people off of opioids faster and, and more effectively. And, you know, throughout uh, the time that I have been involved in this issue, I've had numerous people come up to me and tell me how they have used medical cannabis as, a, a, as the gateway out of uh, opioid use. And this is, opioid use is becoming more and more of a crisis in this country. Uh, we have the governor, uh, uh, have a, Governor Sandoval, having a, a, um, a panel, a forum, uh, a couple of weeks back at the, uh, the MGM Grand, where he invited all stakeholders in this uh, to, uh, to put out their views uh, on this issue, and he's spearheading uh, a, a program, th uh, a bill through the next legislature to uh, severely restrict uh, opioid prescription by doctors. And uh, in the last session, there was a bill that came out which uh, formed a state database uh, which would then look at all patients uh, and all prescriptions that they got, opioid or, or not, uh, and put them into this big database, and the state would crunch these numbers look at people and uh, for doctors who are in the top five percent of uh, opioid prescriptions they would uh, first get warnings from the state medical association then they could have various sanctions put on them and um, as we were talking just before we went on uh, from a libertarian view, I have an issue with this that people should be able to uh, to treat their pain uh, as they see necessary between them and their doctors without having the state really heavily involved in this. Well, the other side would be we have to do something and the source is the people prescribing the drugs supposedly. They kind of see that as the the entry level, not necessarily the one and only, but you know, people who evolve to heroin disproportionately these days at least start with prescription opioid medication so they figure if they can put the clamps on that there they can kind of choke the pipeline from starting and uh, if there are bad doctors out there they want to find them but I, I kind of have to, to yield to you in a way also because once again you know where, where do you really draw that line it's really really difficult to draw that line between pain management between patients who really truly need the help mm -hmm. and trying to trying to restrict uh, trying to restrict the flow of these illegal drugs onto the street but you know I'm not exactly sure how you how you address this well you know in, in part and, and I can say that that personally you know and having open heart surgery earlier this year um, having a hydrocodone prescription was really a good thing in the days and weeks afterwards uh, the the pain was intense and using the opioids was a good thing but as I as I healed I noticed that um, the the hydrocodone that I was taking was proving to be less effective in dealing with that level of pain that I had, and, and I would bump up my dosage and I'd bump it up again. And after several months of this, I said, "No, I, I've got to stop this because I don't want to become dependent." Mm -hmm. And so uh, I can I agree with the idea that uh, it's great for acute use, um, chronic use. Uh, Personally, I'm seeing that it was less effective, but I, I've got to pivot and disagree with what you said that, you know, bad doctors and this is what the state needs to focus on them because I think doctors by and large, yeah, you'll have a few bad apples in every barrel no matter where, what industry that you're looking in, but I think that the doctors are working with the tools that they were given and prior to the 1990s, uh, 
prescription opioid use uh, prescription opioids uh, were very low. Doctors didn't prescribe them very much. And then there was a, a, a swing in the pendulum to say, well, you look at pain and patients pain management and and then they began to over prescribe and now the pendulum is swinging back in the other direction but it's not the doctors Perry I think where you need to focus on or where we need to focus on are the drug makers who the prescription pharmaceutical industry is really the ones who are making more and more of these things uh, and making them more powerful and pushing them on on sure. the physicians but also through the um, uh, through the legislative process. And we have a, an article here from the Associated Press and the Center for Public Integrity uh, that says that the makers of these prescription painkillers have adopted a 50-state strategy that includes hundreds of lobbyists and millions in campaign contributions to help killer weaken measures aimed at stemming the tide of prescription opioids, which are at the heart of, of this crisis, costing Americans a hun or costing 165,000 Americans their lives over the course of these years. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's a big chunk. And the industry and its allies have spent more than $880 million nationwide on lobbying campaign contributions from 2006 to 2015. Sure, I believe it. And look, I heard a statistic not too long ago that said that the United States has you know, not not a very large percentage of the world's population by and large, like what, like 8%, for, yeah, five, eight percent, percent, maybe yeah. something like that. But yet we use up from somewhere between 80 and 90% of, of the, the prescribed opiates, yeah. of the prescribed opiates in the world how the like, are we really in that much pain like there's you know it's just like our prison population statistics right. you know they're right. so five, out of whack five times more more prison population than yeah know, they're so out of whack and it just seems like the statistics data. are so out of whack it's just obvious to see that there's a problem there but you saw this yourself in 2013 when you were up in Carson City because you you were at that time uh, you know uh, you had hired a lobbyist before you even got involved with we can uh, because you knew this was an important issue and uh, you you met uh, we can people up there uh, but you saw the opposition there as well in the final I want to say days but probably the final weeks mm -hmm. um, we really had we thought we had a, a good amount of momentum the votes were there and things were looking really really good and then all of a sudden it all came crashing down and there was this word through through the grapevine that the uh, pharmaceutical industry had made a very very large donation to the Republican Assembly mm -hmm. the caucus mm -hmm. and the, uh, there was a decision that came down within the caucus that they were going to oppose this bill and uh, not a lot of reasons were given. They just had a little meeting and that's how it went. And all of a sudden we were in deep shit and it almost didn't go down. Uh, it was about that that close. There were some very dramatic uh, s dramatic uh, developments in the last 48 hours that mm -hmm. caused this to happen. Two of which, of course, we've referenced it dozens of times on the show, but it was just so so important that we have yep. to bring it back one, up. One being a, a Democrat, uh, Peggy Pierce, who left her deathbed, essentially, to, to cast this vote. Because of the ways that the law was written to where legislators have to be physically present to yep. cast the vote in these yep types of things you can't have a proxy or anything like that you have to fit so they literally had to wheel her in and, and then yeah. Michelle and, and Michelle Fiore who um, you know I think her mom had used medical cannabis and so she had personal experience and knew that it was a good thing and not a bad thing uh, but to some extent I also think that um, that Michelle was flipping off the old boys club there who gave her no respect I think uh, that's what it was mostly and I, I thank her for it for sure Absolutely. because because without Without that uh, bravery or whatever the hell you want to call it, you know, she she made that she turned that tide, and uh, we got the bill passed. Thank God. And mm -hmm. you know, Governor Sandoval was nice enough to sign it. At least he didn't have to. Chose to. No, nope, not uh, at all. But you know, regardless of that, you know, Sandoval but was the one who pushed this anti-opioid. Uh, Bill, bill yeah, last, bill through last, last session. session, and they're going to expand on that this session, and and yet the opioid lobby has been doing everything it can to preserve the status quo of aggressive prescribing, said Dr. Andrew Kolodny, uh, an outspoken advocate for opioid reform. Uh, he he says they're reaping enormous profits from aggressive prescribing, and so uh, once again, I think that if you're going to um, if you really want to seriously address opiate reform in this country, then the way to do so is to pass laws limiting the um, 
the lobbying uh, for the pharmaceutical industry. And post Citizens United, that's a very difficult thing to do. I was going to say, so, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure how you're going to do that. You know, you, I, don't think, uh, I don't think you're allowed to limit contributions anymore. I think mm -hmm. lobbying is through super PACs and things like that. That's kind of an open, an open door at this point. Um, I don't really know what you can, but I don't really know what you can do. To, to how, how do you limit just that industry from lobbying and then not do it? You know what I mean? Where do you close that door if you limit the limit this industry? Is the medical cannabis industry going to be perceived as a prescription? As the you know the medical industry once it gets decriminalized, well, will we ourselves be prohibited by the language that we propose? Friend of the show, Dr. Ivan Goldsmith, um, has said to me exactly that uh, in the past month or so that if they if the governor is able to get this bill through the legislature in the next session and limits this, that they're then going to come back and really clamp down on medical cannabis. Now, personally, I don't see how they can do it that much. I think the horse is out of the barn on that one. But I guess you could argue that it was the same thing with opioids, that, that the, they were widely available and now they're being restricted. So um, Dr. Goldsmith feels that um, this is just the first step in, a, uh, in a, an agenda to shut down uh, Oh, he's believed that for a number of years. I talked access. to him a while ago, and he's believed since the first day I met him that there's, not, there's uh, like you said, a pre-existing agenda mm -hmm. on their idea to kind, of, to kind of break this down over time. But, you know, we'll see if it comes true. I hope he's, I hope he's wrong. <laughs> uh, I, I do, too. But, you know, the, the more that I read on this, and, and I've got, you know, article after article that, that I look at, uh, I, I just get pointed towards uh, Big Pharma here. And here's a, a, another article by Philip Smith out of, of Alternet, and in it he says that uh, fentanyl, for example, is a synthetic opioid several dozen times more potent than heroin, and it's been linked to numeroid opioid overdoses, uh, overdose deaths in the country. And fentanyl is, of course, uh, the the medication, uh, the drug that was in Prince's body when they found him, oh, uh, you oh, know, okay. a couple of months back. But the Jesus. thing was that it was not prescription fentanyl, and uh, the, and on checking, the authorities found that Prince did not have a medical prescription for anything in the prior 12 months. This was actually um, a bootleg product. It was the pills were actually stamped and manufactured to look like hydrocodone, but it was actually fentanyl making up the substance, which oh. is 50 times more powerful. So if you take something, you know, you pop a hydrocodone or two or three, you know, you're going to be off in la-la land. And to take something that's 50 times more potent than that, you can see where somebody could really go over the edge, as he did, and you, you have a fatal overdose. And so part of this problem that we're having and, and this, this opioid op ep epidemic is part of it is because the the drug makers are pushing more and more and more stuff on us but also part of it is that there is this black market out there that's creating these these drugs of lesser lesser quality but higher, higher purity, potency higher, higher potency. potency yeah uh, that are, that are going out and so i i think to go after the doctors in this situation who are uh, the vast majority of them, I believe, working in the best interest of their patients and trying to be sensitive to the, the needs of these patients. Um, I think going after the doctors largely is the wrong target. So what do we, well, but Western medicine also works. You know, big pharma isn't all bad. They make, you know, drugs that do, you know, do wonderful, wonderful things. So uh, how do true. we make that balance between pain management and lack of, you know, there's this big balance to do between, you know, the strength of the drugs versus access versus management and things like that. I heard a, I was watching a television show once and a police officer was talking about this and he said, uh, a politician will never stick it, you know, he comes into office and all of a sudden he knows how to do police work. <laughs> you know, yes. he's like, they never tell, you know, they'll never walk into a school and tell them how to do their business or this and that. But some, for some reason, those f politicians always feel like they can stick their nose in that. And now we're seeing this also. We have people that get elected who are all of a sudden medical professionals all, mm -hmm. also. They have this deep understanding of how drugs are made and the interactions that it has with patients. And, and you know, you really have no education on the on the subject. So how do we... <laughs> How are you going to walk into a big pharmaceutical company full of, you know, board of directors, full of doctors and things like that and tell them, well, this is how it's going to be. They're going to tell you to kick rocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're gonna, you know what the hell you're true. talking about because you don't have MD on the end of your name. And even if you did, 
you know it's just like like i said i don't really know how to how, how to make this balance work well, between and, all the parties and your point is valid about people getting uh you know medical degrees to bestowed on them by virtue of election or job choice uh, uh, because in the last session I was testifying uh, against the uh, the opiate bill that was uh, before us and um, I saw that there were doctors who came up to testify at this thing at this hearing uh, who were trained, who knew what they were doing, had practical experience, and they were all saying, no, this is a bad bill, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But then, uh, then uh, testifying on the other side, there were a couple of judges, uh, there were a couple of uh, law enforcement officers saying, oh no, we can't let that, we have to pass this law because it's so dangerous and this and that. And there, they are, John Hambrick, who's, uh, who is leading the, uh, the assembly there, was ramrodding uh, Governor Sand Val's bill through, and he was saying, oh, no, 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 we, we need to listen to these people. The medical professionals, no, not so much. We don't have to worry about them. It's the law enforcement people, the people working in, in the legal system in general. Those are the ones we have to listen to. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with you that it, it's a, a conundrum for us because you're, you're taking people who are experts and it just casting their opinions aside. And I don't want to act like, you know, let's just say we introduce marijuana as a legal medical option all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that would solve all the world's problems. You know, I don't think we're going to, you know, magically do this because you're still going to have addicts. You're still going to have people that are going to get into this and you're still going to have this problem. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to solve these problems. Oh, absolutely. By doing other things rather than just creating more laws. Well, we're always in quest of a more perfect union. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. But uh, it, it's how do we get there? And you know, you're saying, you know, how do we figure this out? And that is indeed these days the sixty-four billion dollar question because uh, big pharma. Uh, if if you're um, if you have cancer, if you have MS or AIDS or anything like that, uh, and you need these drugs to stay alive. By all means, Big Pharma is your hero. It uh, angers me that they don't work in, with the industry more rather than just trying to squash us. I said it a long time ago. If they were so interested, they should buy into the industry and develop these drugs and rather than just trying to shut us down or just take control of it through legislation. At, yeah, but at um, the same time, Big Pharma you know, is touting the development of pharmaceutical cannabinoids. So yeah. what they're doing is they're trying... They, there's that meme that's been out there for years that... Um, that Smoked medicine is not medicine. You can't possibly do that. And they, totally ignoring the edibles and the infused products mm -hmm. and, and uh, oils and, and stuff. Uh, so, so you know, they go ahead and they develop these pharmaceutical cannabinoids, but all of a sudden, the same company, this fentanyl company, donated, what, half a million? I think we covered it last week briefly. Half they donated million. half a million yeah. dollars in cash to the anti recreational legalization movement in Arizona that's coming up right. this November. And, you know, whispers have it that... Uh, that uh, our friend Adelson has donated some money against the Florida thing again this year, mm -hmm. and also you know what you were uh, there were rumors flying around that say that he's. I, I just heard before we went on just before we went on air that um, that uh, Adelson's people have now filmed and cut the uh, the commercials for the no on question two, and they're going to start hitting the airways. We'll see what happens. Uh, we're going to have to take another commercial break before we wrap it up, and we'll be right back. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? 
Well, the answers to these questions are simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing DigiPath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the DigiPath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And once again, welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour, uh, where we're talking about a, any number of things uh, cannabis-related here in the state and beyond. And one thing uh, that caught my eye uh, a couple of days back uh, was an article posted at Capital and Maine, uh, and it references high times and and how will bud tenders and trimigrants fare if pot is legal. And that that's a term I haven't heard before. Trimigrants, trimigrants. You know, I, people. People who, who just travel around the, the uh, Emerald Triangle or other uh, uh, marijuana cultivation uh, sites and uh, when harvest time comes at the end of the year uh, or at the end of September, October, they go and they, they trim for weeks on oh, end. Oh yeah, the stories are legendary. You know, people go up there and make some scratch. Some, some stories yep. turn out being pretty good. Some stories turning out not so good depending on who you work for, things like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, these people need, uh, need, need workers to harvest their giant ridiculous fields so they do these, and uh, and because this is happening uh, you've got the teamsters union uh and the uh united food and commercial workers unions mm -hmm. friends of ours uh and they've organized dozens of marijuana related businesses in several states and uh it has not all gone smoothly. In April of 2015, UFCW in New Jersey withdrew an organizing position because of legal complications. And you know, somewhat after that, they had other uh, uh, staff problems over there. But they're but they're still working on this. And to hear it, uh, the industry now has the potential to, according to UFCW, the industry has the potential to revive the middle class in the states where it's legal and compel other states to follow suits. For the moment, at least, while other countries' laws remain strict and exporting marijuana remains a, fel a felony, jobs in the cannabis industry are jobs that can't be offshored. They're jobs that are confined to within the states where they're permitted. Others can make money and still afford their workers enough for employees to raise their family and send their kids to school. So so you've got UFCW now saying that um, that these are, are industries which are going to be locally produced and all and, and that's fine. Well, and you know they're they're, trying they're saying to turn jobs you know, into careers. Make, yes. You know, they're 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 trying to make this more than just a the fly by night gig that you have seasonally. They want to turn this into a skill that you can take with you and keep for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, what's We'll see, we'll see if they can get it done. And, and the thing is that right now, uh, uh, trimmers uh, are able to earn uh, in these areas up to um, uh, $200 a day or so. And, and, uh, and, you there was to, a, and you get to sleep on site and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, you know. And uh, the one writer, Sorcia O'Hagans of the Matador Network, uh, said that she uh, made uh, – over five thousand dollars in five weeks, and spent half the time drinking and dancing. And <laughs> that sounds that sounds like fun. And and in fact, um, at this stage, uh, workers in the cannabis industry are being treated better and remunerated better than in any other agricultural industry. But that's because there's still that threat that, well, you might have to use some of that money to hire a lawyer or do other right. things. And so as uh, as this becomes more legal, uh, you can't tell John Deere you've got to cut the price of the tractors. You can't tell your the person you want to buy your, your land from that, no, um, you, you know, your land's worth less now. So ultimately, where they're going to have to cut uh, is that area of of workers rights it but it's an important area to really be looking at and uh if you are interested in this at all or, or going in this direction uh you know you might want to take a look at the ufcw uh website uh united food and commercial workers uh and 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 start taking a look in that and we'll have more information on that or come and yeah. talk to us at our party We're, we have a party coming up and it's on uh, us, well on october 29th we're throwing our halloween party if you came to the last event it was
fantastic. We have a wonderful mansion donated to us by some dispensary owners up on, I believe it's called Casa Montana Court, up in Boulder City overlooking the lake. A it'll beautiful be, place. It'll be on October 29th. If you don't have plans, or even if you do, cancel them and come to ours. Uh, it is a fantastic, fantastic party. We had a great showing last year, good vibes all around, and uh, all the money that we raise is going to help go into our patient program once again to help people who can't afford it get their medical cards for free. So come support the cause, meet some like-minded people, and uh, it'll be a good time all around. It's a terrific party, no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, as Perry said, if you have other plans, it, it's worth canceling for this. This is this is one of the mellowest, best parties you're going to find We have a great raffle. We have fantastic prizes. We'll have a costume contest. We'll have a lot of vendors out, a lot of good companies represented. Uh, if you have your medical card, you know, it's you're friendly to consume on, on, on site. Yep. So, you know, and, it's and, a wonderful and, time. You know, that, that's a, a good point with the, the raffles and stuff. Um, the, the number of giveaways at the weekend parties just continue to astound me, and that's because we get such good support yeah. from the community, from, from the manufacturing community. We're very blessed to, in that yeah, regard. Yeah, absolutely. And we have so. a lot of dedicated volunteers who go around to, uh, to acquire this material and you know make these build these bridges over the course of all these years and all this time all these shows you know it has it's taken a long time so you know we're very very happy to have the the staff that we have in the so by all the, means the check out the we can 702 facebook page uh come on to our site uh get more information but by all means october 29th plan on being there or being square so that's about all the time we have this week thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time